I'll briefly introduce today is this idea about um, what I call the capital project dilemma. And uh, what is that capital project dilemma? So I'll, I'll explain that by just uh, trying to be as brief as possible. And uh, next slide, Margaret, please. So if we think about the capital intensive investments, the, the invest in order for them to be approved, we tend to use in uh, Western societies, uh, cost benefit analysis, right? So cost benefit analysis is a, is a tool that has been uh, developed uh, more than 100 years ago by French en engineers, and then that it was uh, appropriated or uh, by the uh, economists in the in the 40s, uh, uh, late and uh, 50s, no, and it became the the way by which we, uh, uh, as a society, tend to sanction capital investments, project-based capital investments. So, and in, in, in this idea that if we are going ahead with these investments, the benefits need to outweigh the costs, and. Uh, this has created a, a number of complications that have uh, are are is, uh, exacerbating in the in recent years because there's so much we can benefit we can measure right so when we are and this goes back to the session before no so we we cost benefit analysis it tends to be predominantly focused on economic returns things that we can measure based on user willingness to pay so we are going to build this sydney metro, metro or we are going to build a crossrail in london or we are going to build this uh, power station and we know that there will be an output that uh, users are willing to pay for it to to use that uh, so whether it is electricity, water, or, or or transport, and that creates a revenue, and then we can play that uh, future revenue against the the costs of uh, producing the assets, and that's kind of what cost benefit analysis does. Okay, we can extend it a little bit to incorporate wider economic implications, but. There's a lot of other stuff we know projects are under pressure to do that is very difficult to go into the cost benefit analysis. So I tend to tell my my students and my uh, uh, whether in executive education or or, or in, a, in undergraduates that what we are approving these days it tends to be what we def we can define, what we can't, and what we uh, we can observe. Uh, next slide, please. But this, what we approve, is fundamentally different from what, from, from what we actually build, right? It's not going to be the same. There's no way, in uh, at least in uh, open access, access uh, societies, uh, liberal economies, that we'll be able to, to, to build what we approve. So this creates, and that, that, that slide kind of illustrates the, an evolution, which is kind of the stereotypical behavior of capital intensive projects of costs over time for one particular project. This case is a crossrail, these uh, uh, commuters rail that is going uh, to cross London from east to west. And uh, over time that project was negotiated with society in terms of what should this project be about what are the what sometimes uh, economists call the externalities that the project needs to inc uh, internalize so what and so you have all these interest groups in society after the project uh, has been approved that say well that project can't go ahead because what is that project doing in for for the environment what is that project do doing for in terms of uh, local job creation, well, I don't think I don't think the designs for the stations are good enough. They should be world class designs because they should also be uh, opportunities to showcase the talent of architects in the in the Brit in the British environment, and so on and on and on. And so you keep negotiating the scope with society after the project gets approved, and of course this is going to create many benefits. But those are not the traditional benefits that go into the cost benefit analysis, right? These are benefits that are going to be captured by groups of uh, non-users, whether it is the architectural fraternity that is going to benefit from, from an investment uh, in world-class designs, where there are local communities because are going to benefit from uh, the addition of uh, new car parking spaces near the, the stations, whether it is... Uh, uh, 
labor that is going to benefit for an improvement in uh, health and safety laws uh, or, the, or, or the society as, as a whole, because it's uh, going to be benefit from an imp a late improvement in, uh, in security and other standards. No? So the, our expectations as society evolve and the project keeps negotiating the, its purpose and that translates into a scope as the project gets in the early stages of development, throughout development, and then as it enters into the weaver. And these, the projects are approved maturely, right? So even when you policy makers approve a project, the planning or the development there is not yet completed, no? So the, you have this evolution about uh, what, uh, until we understand what society is going to permit. And this now creates a, a real dilemma because from a, a traditional perspective, a traditional perspective of uh, in the project management profession, this evolution of uh, cost growth is something that uh, is penalized, right? So it's uh, it seems to be bad management that this that the cost was not being able to be controlled to stay within that ideal budget. And uh, sometimes also this uh, negotiation of the project with society uh, also in, in implies that uh, the, the, the project is going to take longer, which again, and the traditional uh, project management uh, norms, it's going to penal pe be penalized because these are about delays. We don't, we see, we are still, we have these uh, deep-seated models, mental models that say that uh, high-performing projects should stay on time. And if you read a lot of the work that is coming out from the artificial intelligence fraternity applied to projects, they keep beating the drum. Well, uh, use artificial intelligence and we will help your project stay on time. So these is our, there are lots of vested interests in society as well to perpetuate a narrative that a high-performing project is one that's on time within budget, which is totally at intention with another narrative that says a high performing project is one that distributes value, that goes beyond producing economic returns to also create, allow non-user groups to appropriate value. So, in, in, and now this is creates a, a dilemma for managers and that leads to my last slide, which is, at what point in time if uh, do you enfranchise your non-user stakeholders, right? Uh, and perhaps, uh, Margaret, you can move to the last slide. So, because if you enfranchise the non-user stakeholder, uh, and, and uh, okay, this is just a, a slide of a, Pro, uh, projects uh, as social tools to distribute value. And uh, the first, on the, on the left, you kind of have a map of the key non-user stakeholders for London 2000, uh, the Olympics, and you can see the, the amount of stakeholders that uh, are going to, they are all essential in the sense that they all control essential resources without which the project will not progress, whether it is political support, whether our permits or, or consents or other type of resources. No? So you really have to negotiate Negotiate that scope with the stakeholders. And below, sometimes people say, well, that is only uh, happens for large projects. The project below actually is relatively small. It's just uh, an expansion of an existing highway. And uh, with our students, we just try to map all the non-user non stakeholders that have been trying to directly influence the project scope. And again, we were surprised to see the complexity of uh, stakeholder relationships with, that uh, happened just around a relatively small uh, uh, highway expansion project. So what is the dilemma? The dilemma here is, when should I enfranchise all these stakeholders? Now, because if I traditionally, the law says you need to consult stakeholders, right? But consultation means that you still uh, retain authority to make unilateral decisions as to what you are going to give to these stakeholders. So you don't need to negotiate. Now you consult because the law says you need to consult. And if you don't consult, you are violating the law. And then you, you shut the door and you decide what should I do to make sure that I meet the concerns that are legitimate of my stakeholders. 
And you can do that in a unilateral way. And that keeps you within the law. But what we know is that is not going. But if you just do that, it will be fine from a cost benefit analysis perspective, but probably you are going to face significant cost growth once you actually start to engage in consensus-oriented negotiations with stakeholders. But if you enfranchise them to earlier, then you, you run into a different problem, right? Because then you start making concessions or compromises with your stakeholders that puts pressure on your cost growth. The benefits do not are not being captured by traditional cost benefit analysis. So people see, wow, well, I don't understand where the money is going. Why should I, we proceed with this project? So this is a real dilemma that we are just about to start tackling in the project management literature. And it, I believe it really uh, entails a, a, an exciting uh, research agenda. Mm -hmm.